Shalom, shalom. Greetings to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, wherever you are. What an opportunity, what a blessing to have you and have this opportunity to share with you the gospel. And we bless the Lord for being who he is. The love that we know and the love who we'll continue to discover because that's all he is. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray for you that today you will receive something. You will understand the power that is in the heart and in the mouth. That combination is very key for the experience, for you to experience salvation. We've been learning the understanding of uh, the word Lordship, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What does it mean when we say, when the Bible says uh, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. I was explaining the Lordship of Jesus. When you confess that Jesus is the Lord, brothers and sisters, it means a Lord. It means that you belong to him. It means that he owns you. It means that no one else has power over you other than Jesus Christ. Nothing else will be able to take over your life but Jesus Christ. And you are declaring that he has risen from the dead. And you are using the very word that the Jews used to use uh, when they wanted to talk about Yahweh. So they used to use that word, Yahweh. It was very, very significant. So Paul is using the same word to declare that we're talking about Yahweh. This is amazing. So you belong to him. And this was used, of course, in the Old Testament. And it was the name of God. So the one who confesses that Jesus is Lord affirms his deity. You are saying that God, that Jesus is God. You are saying that Jesus is God. This is amazing. When you study, of course, in Romans, you continue later in this chapter 10, verse 13, you will see the Paul quotes Joel 2, 32, where the remnant of Israel is envisaged as calling upon God by invoking his name, whereby he say that if you call upon his name, he shall be saved. So Paul presents Jesus to his Jewish audience as fulfilling the role of the Lord God, in short, Paul seemed to have no qualms about transferring God's role in eschatological salvation to the risen Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The whole work that Jesus did and rose from the dead, Paul is saying, He is the Lord. He is God. That the work he did, he had the ability and power to accomplish it and no one else. Only him in that position had the power to do it. So the two elements of the inward heart belief and the outward confession of the mouth are brought together into this verse. So he's not only teaching us to confess with our mouth, with our lips, or profess with your mouth in order to be saved. Get it? He's not saying that you just use your mouth to be saved. No. We are to profess the faith, but the profession without authentic faith attaining it will justify no one and will fail to deliver the genuine experience of salvation. So the idea of confession, confessing is not enough. Paul is not talking about the confessing because you will not experience salvation until it is genuine from within your heart. It's from the revelation that is full of your heart that you confess. You only confess what is full of your heart. Whatever that, feel, whatever that fills your heart becomes your confession. So he also uses the word believe because he says, if you confess 
confess, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart. Believe. What is the word uh, believe mean? What does it mean here? The Greek word of believe means, believe means, pistel. Pistel, it means to trust in, to have faith in, to be fully convinced of, to acknowledge and rely on. It carries in, in it three vital aspects that constitutes living faith. You see, you have to trust in. And that is the meaning of believing. Believing is fully convinced. When you say that you believe into something, that means you are fully convinced of that very thing. Do you know that people claim to believe and yet they don't believe because they are not fully convinced? So the, the conviction is key here. Before you confess or profess anything, are you really convinced? or you're just speaking things outwardly. So, one, this means that a person trusts that places the entirety of oneself in the safe keeping of the object of one's faith. So you mean that you trust and place all your entire being into someone's hands. It is that complete, total dependency. Number two, it means a mental assent by means of intellectual persuasion. So you have to be convinced in your intellect that results the mind on a fixed conclusion beyond argument. That is the meaning of believing. So you believe when you say that you believe, it means your mind is fixed on a certain conclusion. You have come to a conclusion that you don't need any further argument. Glory to God. That is what it means to believe. You know, many people don't believe. They just uh, guess. <laughs> they guess. They don't know. They are not sure. But the full conviction, when you are fully convinced beyond argument, beyond, and you are convinced of the conclusion, not even the head, the heading and the, the, the body and the conclusion. You're talking about the conclusion. You have had something. You had it throughout until you came to the conclusion. And number three is important to understand that believing is also an ongoing volitional commitment of the totality of one's being towards the object of one's faith. So, of course, this means... You do, if you believe into something, it will continue. You have chosen to continue, totally move in that very direction. So, and you're using your will to say yes, yes, yes. You see, that is believing. But I'm telling you, you cannot believe something that you have not heard. You have to hear something and then you believe. You have to hear something before you believe. You cannot believe into in, 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 in emptiness. You cannot believe, you cannot confess to believe into something that is not there. You first have to have the object of belief. And then you fix your gaze, your eyes, your heart, your mind, your conviction towards it. That's what the Bible means by believing. So you see the verse is saying that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you shall be saved because you believe with your heart. That means you totally, totally agree. You are completely relying on that very conclusion. See, it is that inward conviction and then that outward confession. So you see this deep communion com co combination of the two. It does not begin with the mouth. It begins with the heart. You agree with God. You get to know something and then you are convinced. And what are you convinced of? Remember, he's saying with the mouth, the Lord Jesus. So you believe you confess the Lordship of Je the Lord Jesus, 
but you believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. So you don't doubt that Jesus came from the dead, came out from the dead. You see? You know and you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. So you don't have any doubt in your heart. You don't have any doubt in your heart. That is believing. Believing is that conclusion you have made out of a certain thing. So in other words, you know that believing refers to placing one's whole trust in the resurrected Christ and living with Jesus as one's Lord. So you know he's your Lord and he rose from the dead. In other words, he's here with us. He's present. He's with you. Glory to God. You fully, fully believe that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And he says, you believe in thine heart. So what is the meaning of heart in this verse? The meaning of the heart, the Greek, is cardia. Cardia. It is attributed to the thoughts, reasonings, understanding, design, will, affections, and judgment. So it's about what you judge, how you judge things, your will, your affections, your understanding, see, your thoughts, your reasonings. So all that is talking about the heart. It's part of the heart. See? Therefore, if that is true, then the heart is used as... He is used in the place of the mind in general. So the understanding, the memory, the intention and desire of man and his conscious that's the heart so you you need to know that we never find in the scriptures the contrast between the head and the heart between intellect and emotion which is so characterized is characterized of our usage today you see the way we use that head intellect, you know, emotions, the way we do separate them. Believing with the heart includes the assent of the mind, the consent of the will, and the credence of the intellect. It is the particular mode of thinking that is guided to its subject, to its object, you know, by the testimony of authority of another or by some kind of information so someone will speak certain things will, will, will teach you or give a message and as you hear in that message because that message conveys a, an information you it results in you believing it results in believing and also it can be a testimony from someone it can also bring you to believe so it is a result the believing cannot be cannot exist un until there is that message, that information which is given to you. This is what I'm, I've been saying. So we hear the message, and we hear, we get to learn that he's the Lord, Lord, and he died and rose from the dead. And once we get to understand all that, once we process that in our minds, even the intellect, the emotions, the will, everything comes together. That's what is called the heart. Say you believe with your heart. You believe with all your heart. See, your intellect is part of it. Your emotions, at times you can even cry because you believe fully, you fully, fully believe in something. So believing is a combination of all that which is within you to give, bring you to a certain conclusion and conviction. When you believe with your heart like that, that he rose from the dead, my, 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 of course, you experience salvation. That is how it works. Shalom, shalom.